The next section is the property manager's plan or the management plan. We did not really talk in depth about the listing agreement plan. We talked about the listing agreement, the form that we use, and we just talked about the management agreement. Typically, when you go and talk to a seller, you will give them your plan on how to market the property. And I would say half of the time, that listing is secured already, meaning it's your friend and they're calling you and saying, hey, hey, Raymond, buddy, I want you to come and list my house. And it's kind of in the bag, so to speak. Half of the time, they're going to tell you, hey, I'd like to talk to you and see what your plan is. And then I'm going to talk to two other agents and pick the best one. That scenario could happen. We did not talk about a listing plan per se, meaning, oh, I'm going to put it here to market it. I'm going to put it on this MLS. I'm going to put it in Zillow. I'm going to create a billboard. We didn't really talk about that plan. We talked mainly about the listing agreement. Well, the management plan is the very same concept that you would discuss with the property owner or soon to be your client. You would understand or need to know what his objectives are. Is it to generate a bunch of income? Is it to maintain the property and status quo? And then he's going to flip it out in two or three years after the appreciation you're going to need to understand what are the regional and neighborhood markets? Are there competition? Is there, you know, a whole bunch of vacancies in apartments nearby? And you're going to have to have a plan that is specific for that property. Here's what we will do with your downtown property, because I'm going to also want to manage your 12 unit out in the suburbs or your commercial property may have a different plan that is specific to that property, whereas a single family home rental plan and management plan is specific to that property. One of the things that you are going to often be required are the financial reports that the landlord or the client or the principal is going to want to see. And we can go back over here and we have done this once before in a previous chapter. Um, if you think back to the appraisal section, I told you we would see these equations again. So you have, let's just refresh our memory. You have gross operating income. And then remember we subtracted vacancy and credit loss, which gave us this number called the effective gross and from the effective gross, we subtracted the expenses to get the net operating income, which we call the NOI. That's the slang for that. And then we subtracted debt service to get cash flow. So you guys should remember this from a previous chapter. Using those same equations, you can see where a property manager now can actually track things like this vacancy and credit loss. You can track the history of how many actually paid and how often was a property vacant. So you will be able to give that report to the landlord or to your client or to the lessor. You will be able to track expenses. At the end of the year, you can say, hey, dude, we spent this much on marketing. We spent this much on lawn care. We spent this much on window cleaner. And that will allow you to then calculate his net income. And when you start doing this over multiple years, you can then start doing profit and losses. You can start doing forecasting and budgeting. All of these things and all of these reports can be given to your client based upon this equation that we have looked for. There's the monthly flow. 
uh, cash flow. There's net operating income. See, total income, less operating expenses, where total income is that gross income. All of these reports can be generated. And when we're starting to deal with income, there's all kinds of income. We have mentioned this in a previous chapter. Do not just think about the rent. There could be late payments. You may collect utility payments. There may be vending contracts like the laundry mat down in the basement or Coke machines. There could be storage rentals on, uh, on site. There could be other things, pool passes. Maybe you rent out the uh, clubhouse. There could be tennis passes. So there's all kinds of income that could be generated. And then there's all kinds of expenses. Typically, there are two types. They split out expenses. The first one would be a fixed expense. Salaries was a good example of a fixed expense. Every month, the property manager gets X or the maintenance men get X, as opposed to things that could be variable expenses. A common one here is landscaping, building repairs. One month you may have, you know, three tenants move out and you've got to paint three times. The next month, nobody moves out. So that repair is zero that month. That's why they're called variable versus things that are fixed expenses. That allows us to create profit and loss statements. And you can do those profit and loss statements monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, things of that nature. You could figure out all the gross receipts to get a net profit. That also allows you comparison Hopefully you're doing this management for this uh, client over several years. So now you can start seeing, well, two years ago, we were 97% occupied because we tracked all the vacancy. We have declined over the last three or four years. We are now down to 94%. Those monthly or annual or whatever that you do, will allow you a comparison. If you do it monthly, you could say, well, this month compared to last month or the second quarter compared to the third quarter or, you know, 2021 versus 2022 versus 2023. There's, you could do it annually. All of these things can be done based off of this basic generic counting uh calculations that we have talked about prior in another chapter. Now, when it comes to renting the property, let me ask you, who sets the rental rates? Hit pause, think about it, and come back. All right, you're back, or you didn't leave. Um, who sets the rental rates? Well, the answer is, the market sets the rental rates. And if you don't believe me, think about a office building or a rental or a high rise apartment building on Fifth Avenue in New York compared to, you know, in Nashville, Tennessee, which do you have the same building, right? Still 12 stories, still has 80 units in it, but the market's not the same. So a lot of people want to guess that the landlord sets the rates. No, the rental market sets the rates. However, those rates better cover all of the charges that are going to be required. All of the expenses, all of the taxes, all of that. So that rental rate better cover that. It also has to be in line with all of the other buildings in that market. And it has to make sure that it generates a profit for the client, i.e. the landlord. So here's a question. If or do you want your 20 unit apartment complex, let's do it better. Let's say 
you're managing a 60 unit apartment complex. Do you want that 60 unit apartment complex to be 100% occupied? The answer is no, actually you don't. If you have a high occupancy rate like 99 or 100, that indicates that you are the lowest rental rate in the market. The national average for apartments, when you start looking at 25 or more, is literally only around 94 to 96% occupied. You want one unit to be vacant and that will allow you to go, well, everybody else is at 750, all the other units, we're going to hold this one out for 800. And if we get it, then we will slowly start moving the others as those tenants go out or renew their lease to meet that new market. And you can increase your rates. Conversely, the other side is true. If your property is only 80% occupied, then your rental rates are too high and people are going to your competitor to rent, therefore you're 80%. So you might have to lower some of those until you see that occupancy go from 80 up around that national average of 94, 95%. All right. You will be in charge of marketing and the advertising. Remember, there are fair housing acts we still have to abide by and federal other federal laws like the ADA that we talked about. Those marketing costs are going to be added on top of the management fee. That management fee that I get paid is the fee that I pay, or I'm sorry, misspoke, the fee that you pay me to deal with the property. If you want to put an ad in the newspaper, the cost of that is certainly not going to come to me. It is going to go to you as an expense that you will then get to write off later. One of the big jobs you may have is selecting tenants. Now, here is a big caveat. If I were you, I'd write a star next to this. If this is something that you are going to go into, you want to go into property management, you better make sure that you create or design some methodology to pick a tenant that does not rely on any questionable law, right? Because we still have fair housing. You cannot discriminate based on race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, or disability. However, there could be other things you discriminate on, like their income. Do they make four times the rent per month? That may be a standard that you have. If your rent is $1,000 a month, you want their job to be making $4,000 a month. Otherwise, they're not making enough and they may not be able to make the rental payment and that's going to cause you heartaches through courts and lawyer fees and eviction and downtime when they move out, all of that. So there better be some methodology that you create so that you do not get yourself in a world of hurt. We just mentioned fair housing. You also have, remember the ADA law, the Americans with Disability Act. And I told you at the time, that's not really a real estate law. It's a consumer law. If you're managing an apartment building, your tenants may come into your office to pay their rent. Well, that is public access to goods and services. And that is Title III, remember? You may have an employee that works for you in that office that has a disability and you have to make reasonable accommodations for that employee. That's Title I of the ADA. So you still have ADA issues 
inside of your business of property management. Plus, your business is the rental of property that is going to be the fair housing. Now, assuming it's apartment complexes, right? If you are renting strip centers and you're renting out to businesses, you still may have ADA issues, but you may not have the fair housing law because fair housing law does not necessarily apply to commercial properties. Collecting rents. This is something that has changed over time quicker than they can actually print a new edition. In all of my spaces that I rent, and I currently rent probably uh, five different spaces for different businesses that I own. I will tell you now, well, I have three spaces because two of them I own the building. All three of the spaces that I rent in today's world actually now have an automatic withdrawal from my bank account that directly takes the money out of my account on the first of the month. <laughs> Gone are the old days of showing up at the house and collecting cash or a check or something like that. Now, that may still happen. And there are some landlords that I know to this day that still show up on the first of every month on their rental homes to collect rent, either in a check or cash form. And they use that as a chance to keep an eye on the property. They are at least going once a month. So that's going to be up to you.